this month's webinar. Good evening. Welcome to this month's webinar, The New Houses of Pompeii, presented by the North American Cambridge Classics Project and sponsored by Cambridge University Press. Sorry. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> we are so delighted this evening to have Margaret Ann back with us again as our guest presenter. Uh, Margaret Ann lives in Barrie, Ontario, which is uh, north of Toronto. She began teaching the Cambridge Latin course in 1991 for 25 years at the Barrie Central Collegiate until it closed in 2016. She then started um, another program at Innisdale Secondary School in 2016 and retired from that program in 22. However, as we know, most Latin teachers don't actually retire because she is back in the classroom for this term teaching Latin and some French. Margaret Ann has a mild obsession with Pompeii. She has been there 60 times and is about to make her 61st trip in March. So if anybody is an expert on Pompeii, it is Margaret Ann Gillis. Uh, she is also a member of our NACCP board and uh, she was featured in our newsletter that was uh, published earlier. She's also one of our workshop presenters and we are just delighted to have her with us. We are recording this webinar and if any of you need a certificate, if you'll just please email us at training uh, at cambridgelatin.org. We will get a certificate to you as soon as possible. So Margaret Ann, tell us all about the new houses. Oh my goodness, I am so honored. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to talk about some of the new houses in Pompeii. And I hope that people have an opportunity to make a visit there in the next little while to see all of these great things. And really tonight's presentation was inspired by a friend of mine who teaches at Cambridge. And I was able to go to a presentation that he gave a few years ago about the Grand Tour and how Pompeii really inspired people to travel and, and to see the world as it was, particularly around the Bay of Naples and Pompeii. So we really have to thank uh, this person right here, King Charles III. Now, when we think about King Charles III and we think about archeology span and we think about excavation at this time, it wasn't really excavation. It was more like plundering and filling his palaces and the palaces of his friends all over Europe with as many wonders as he could possibly dig from Pompeii and other areas in the Bay of Naples. And so here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but right here is part of the way in which we rediscovered Pompeii about 1500 years after it was sealed off from view. And that's the, actually the water fountain from um, Domenico Fontana when he was building a water channel from the river Sarno to Torre Annunziata, where the people really required a new fresh water source because so many people were moving there in order to work in the factories that were producing munitions. And although Domenico Fontana found, you know, frescoes and mosaics and things, he didn't really pursue that at all. He was more concerned about getting the water to Torre Annunziata. And so the uh, site has actually left this there as part of the historical record of what has happened to Pompeii, so people can understand that. Um, Charles III then, about 200 years after Fontana walked away, once again came across people who were building wells. And sure enough, what did they do? They broke into a house and they found some frescoes on the walls and some statues. And so he decided that this would be an excellent way to start to open up Pompeii for view. That's really where we find Sir William Hamilton. And Sir William Hamilton was the British envoy that had come to Naples to work in the court there. And so when he began to explore the area, particularly tombs, he collected a large amount of red figure pottery and he became kind of an expert in red figure pottery. And there, of course, is his very famous wife, Emma, and she used to dress up sometimes to look like figures on those red figure pots. And there is a there's a little cartoon lampooning him that's found in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, where he's always looking, you know, to find that perfect find for his house. But it started the whole notion of antiquarianism. 
And in fact, although he might have, you know, removed a number of things to his personal um, home in England, one of the things that he did really open up was the notion of we need to see how the people at this time lived. Remember that the Grand Tour was really only available to those people who had money and leisure time and could make a considerable journey, which would have been very expensive and almost very dangerous as well, to the southern part of Italy and particular to the Bay of Naples. And he used to take them on tour. He became actually an amateur volcanologist. And for my American colleagues, in 1776, he actually put out a book where he talked about the volcanoes in the two Sicilies. So he became kind of an expert. But what was more important is he started this fascination that people still have to this day with Pompeii. And so what I wanted to ask everyone in the audience was, do we still need to know what goes on behind closed doors? Are we still drawn by people and their houses? And so I put up four very well-known homes that people would would kind of recognize impressive edifices, large, too urban, too rural. Of course, Buckingham Palace right here. We have Chatsworth, which is down in Devonshire. Over here, we have Highclere Castle, which was very important for two reasons, for Downton Abbey fans, because that's where Downton Abbey was filmed, and also because this is the home of the Carnarvons. So this family was actually behind funding the excavation of King Tutankhamun's tomb. And then of course, over here, we have the White House. And so when you look at these houses, just like people who went to Pompeii, you're interested not only in the exterior, which is impressive in and of itself, but you're also really interested in what's behind those windows. And if you think about it, and I'd like to just point this out in terms of tourism, there were about um, 660,000 people that visited Buckingham Palace. There were about 800,000 people that visited um, Chatsworth House, roughly a little bit more. 850,000 people, just under a million people went to the White House. And Highclere Castle sadly only had nearly 100,000 people visit uh, these their um, impressive holdings there. But I'd like to point out Pompeii only 66 hectares, a fraction of the size of these other very magnificent houses, saw in the year before COVID, 3.8 million people. So to put that into perspective, that's almost double the population of, of Toronto walked through these streets. Which when you think about the draw and the allure that goes back to the time of King Charles, it's still very much prominent. And as uh, the new superintendent starts to open up more houses, I think you're going to see more people wander through the streets. So here we are, we're looking back to Vesuvius. And so here is the Via Nola. This is the Via Vesuviana. This, of course, we all know very well because this is Caecilius's house. So I thought what we do is we kind of stay in Regio 5, if we could, and look at all of those wonderful houses there, the neighbors of Caecilius, because there are a couple of new houses that have been opened in this region. And then I'd like to jump over to one of his other neighbors, the Vetii, and show you the house of the Vetii, which is absolutely spectacular. I remember going to this house in 1998 when I had an opportunity actually with Pat Bell to go to Pompeii and we got to go into the house of the Vetii and at that time there were only a few rooms that you could see and you really didn't get a sense of the artwork. 20 years after they closed it they reopened it and the lineups to get in are hours long so you stand in the blistering sun until you can actually make your way through the house but I think you'll really like the artwork that you see there. So we're going to confine our ourselves really to Regio 5, which is right here. Um, but then we will jump across and then we will go out to the Herculaneum Gate if we have time and I haven't bored the daylights out of everybody. All right, so here's our beloved Caecilius house. And don't forget that right here, this is the dating point for this house to second, third century BCE, probably the second century, those dato marks right there. And beside him, and I, I apologize that my picture is behind this. This is this is the house of Lida and the Swan. And in that house, they found all of these little amulets, these little, they believe that they were used for magical purposes to drive away evil spirits. So that's literally just down the street from Caecilius' house. 
In fact, it's just up here. And I always thought it was just a hill because any time that I had ever passed by prior to 2018, all I saw were bushes and overgrown brambles and things like that. And there was actually a house. There's way more to that house under the hill that we haven't gotten to. So here we can see that there's the Via Vesuvio. And right here is Caecilius House. We're all familiar with Caecilius House. Well, now if you go down the street, Something that I had never paid any attention to ever because it was always overgrown. It was always blocked off. There is a tiny little street right here called the Vicolo della Nozze d'Argento. And it's really interesting because it's named after the biggest house in this section of Pompeii, the House of the Silver Wedding. And if you would talk to people prior to this year, they would always talk about the catastrophe of the roof because the roof was so bad. This past July, they have opened this house to the public. But it's, it's important for a couple of different reasons. First of all, this house is a neighbor to two other houses which were opened two years ago, the House of Orion and the House of the Garden. And we've talked a little bit about those houses and I'll just briefly touch on it. Of course, there's the thermopolium that you see right here. And then you would turn down this little teeny weeny road here to come to those other two houses which are still under active excavation. I never paid any attention to this wall. I didn't really pay any attention to this house because it didn't dawn on me that this was actually the house of the silver wedding. Though I could see the crane, I didn't have in my mind that the crane was actually a part of that house. And what was really astounding was um, it's the size of it. It's the scale of it. It's the artwork that you find. And so I was going to point out some things that we could think about as we're moving our way through the houses to pay attention to. So we're going to come down this road. We're going to turn in. And we're going to come here first to the Thermopolium and to the House of Orion and the Garden and then back to the House of uh, the Silver Wedding right here. And one of the things I'd like to point out um, is that it's adjoined to the House of Orion. So possibly it was a much larger edifice that had been subdivided. Possibly this house joined onto the back of it. It's dated to about the third century BCE. But one of the things that I really wanted to point out was, do you see this little teeny, this little passageway right there? That is the posticum. There are two postica. One is here and one is on the other side by their garden. And what's really interesting is what the purpose of that posticum would be. When I was in the house, actually, um, this summer, I really didn't pay any attention to it um, because you can't get there. It's kind of blocked off from where the public is allowed to go. But I wanted to talk a little bit about that when we visit the house inside. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is there's the size of the house, um, but if we go back to our friend Caecilius, our beloved Caecilius, his house, which is right here, it's actually two houses, is not inconsequential in terms of its size. It's just very different in the way that it's decorated. And so here, um, unfortunately, my picture is in front of it. There is a little square. Possibly there are more houses here. Possibly there are shops here. There is definitely a fountain here. And this is the fellow that I went into the site with to see those two houses originally. This is Stephen. And when we were walking by, we had no idea that the broken wall to our right was actually the house of the Silver Wedding. So here's the Thermopolium. We talked a little bit about this at a, at a previous um, webinar. This is now behind glass, which will protect it from the rain and the wind, but it will not protect it from the blistering sunlight, which will bleach it within about a decade or so. So as many pictures as we can take of it to remind us of exactly how bright those colors are is very important. Um, this is also probably a very upscale thermopolium as well. And don't forget, this is where they found remnants of pork and duck inside these um, containers. So this was a this was a fairly substantial thermopolium to serve a number of houses in this area. And if we continue along down the street, um, and one of the things that I, I will point out, and I'll come back to it again, is in Pompeii, they didn't match the the street to the house. Like here, if we build a house, we will bring in a digger and we'll flatten the land and we'll build our house on top. That's not how they built their houses. They built their houses to fit the shape of the hill. And so when we walk through this area in Regio 5, the sidewalks are very, very high. 
The road is very low. It's very steep, but it's also very narrow. And I believe that the people who own these houses prevented the road from being enlarged um, because it meant that you didn't have as many visitors, as much traffic, and it would make it much quieter. So the first house we're going to go into is right here. This is the house of Orion. This is actually the atrium when you come through the first floor. And right there, unfortunately, that's what the impluium looks like. It's kind of collapsed in on itself. But what I really want you to pay attention to is the shape of this stone right here and the color that you see, because we're going to come back and see that in just a second. This is why it's called the house of Orion. This beautiful Cocha Pesta floor, which has all of these little tiny bits of marble in it, and this exquisite mosaic in the center. This clearly was uh, a dining room, because if you look, you can see how you could put co coaches on the three sides and then look into the center to see this beautiful piece of artwork. The walls are almost kind of secondary to the beauty of the floor. Just not far beyond that in a secondary room, because you can only really visit the atrium. The rest of the house is very delicate. There is another mosaic. We don't know exactly what the subject of that second mosaic is. They're trying to do some work to reconstruct some of it so they can unpick that. But you can see how much work they had put into creating these really lovely floor spaces. And it seems to me that either you put your money into the walls, you put your money into the floors, and sometimes in some houses, you put your money into both of them. If we come out of the House of Orion, which only takes like a few minutes to look through, we come down here to the House of the Garden. And again, I point out these blocks at the top, just like at Caecilius' house, which helps us date it. And this house is really important because this is the house that created the Fuhrer over when did Vesuvius actually erupt? Was it August or was it November? And so there is a very tiny, a little carbon um, inscription that you can see on the wall right here, which mentions November. And so many people suggest that maybe there was an error um, perhaps in the transmission of the story, of course, to Tacitus, maybe it was in people who were copying over the um, the transcripts or the, the manuscripts of Tacitus. And of course, they made a mistake. Some people would say that the archaeological records showing pomegranates being in the house itself and in the various areas with sort of the pomegranates only really come into full fruit in October and November. Maybe November is a better time for it. I am not of any opinion whatsoever. I will go with whatever the scholars say. I just follow along. But this house is really important because of that, but also because of the garden. Now, okay, this is why it's called the house of the garden, because 50% of this house is garden. Now, it doesn't look like much when you're looking out, but you have to have vision. You know, that's what real estate agents would tell you. You have to have vision of what you can put in there. And of course, they will very likely go back and add plant material like they have to so many of the other houses to give a context for it. Looking out onto that garden, you can see a beautiful triclinium right here. So it was brightly colored and it would fit, if you, if you think about it, you would have nothing but a feast for the eyes because you would have all of these beautiful plants in the garden and then all of the, the bright painting around you. The floor is covered currently, so I'm not exactly sure what's underneath of it because it's covered to protect it from the scaffolding that you see. And in the picture right here, and I remember Pat Bell talking about these little faces that you would see in Pompeii. Well, here, they think that the little face that you see right here in the wall is this lady right here, they think that she might actually be the owner of the house. They're not exactly sure, but it's a romantic notion to think of it. But one of the things I wanted you to pay attention to here, revisiting this, is the scale of the garden. Because when we return to the house of the silver wedding, it is the garden that you have to pay attention to. Again, about 50% of the floor space of this house is garden. It is a massive construction. It originally belonged to a fellow by the name of Lucius Albucius Celsus, and he's mentioned in um, graffiti. He's mentioned also in as owning this house, and it was renamed to the House of the Silver Wedding in 1893 to honor the marriage between, or the, the 25th wedding anniversary, excuse me, 
of King Umberto and his wife Margarita. So it, it has, you know, some very important prominence in the sense that they wanted to recognize something very important in Italian history. Um, the next time I go back to Pompeii, I will be paying particular attention to the exterior walls. Until really I was looking at doing all of the pictures for this particular webinar, I didn't really ever pay attention to the exterior walls before. And on this house, and when we come to the Vetii, what I want to do is point out what the walls look like. It would seem that the upper part of the walls, in this case, in many of the houses that you find in Regio 5, they're all whitewashed in a white plaster. And on the bottom, you find that red chinabar color. And one of the things to point out with chinabar, if you have watched Bethany Hughes' special on Pompeii, she mentions that chinabar is about 45 times the cost of white paint. So if you think about putting that on the interior of your house, you're wealthy. What about putting it on the exterior of your house? What does that tell people about who you are? And would this be a way of showing and demonstrating your wealth before people ever walked through the front door? And again, here is that wall right there that Stephen and I walked by, and we didn't even pay any attention to the fact that it actually belongs to this house right here. So I'll just point out a couple of things before we go in. First of all, here's the entrance. We have a massive atrium right here. And remember that this is really the public part of the house. This is where your business associates, people you're doing, um, you're involved in political uh, activities with, this is where they would come. And there are two stairways. There's one here, right by number B, and there's one here in room G, which means that by being on the interior of the house, the second floor is accessible to the members of the family who are in the household, which is very important. So likely the second floor, the second story, it's not something that they're renting out. It's for their own personal use. And the other thing which is really cool about this is um, there's this little passageway right here between H and K. And I have a picture um, to show you what it would have looked like, I think, to someone walking through that house. The other thing to pay attention to is the fact that the atrium contains four columns around the impluium. And that's because it's a Tuscan atrium. So it has this, this grand feel to it even I think more so than the house of Menander. We have a garden on the extreme left of the house over here, O. And so there was that little passageway that I was telling you to pay attention to right here. We have a beautiful garden here. There's a swimming pool here because this is the bath complex. This is the private part of the house here, the peristelium that the family itself would enjoy. And then over on the extreme right is a massive garden. Uh, you, so if you think about it, it's like having your own country estate within the middle of a very, very busy city. And so if you will allow me, uh, we'll just walk into the house right now. And this is one of the things that really get, gets me. Um, I, I There was a long lineup on the day that I went, so I was very lucky to get in when I did. But people who bring backpacks I have to just do a little PSA on behalf of the people in the city of Pompeii at the moment. Please, if you can get away without bringing a backpack into the site, it would be most appreciated because people inadvertently all the time bump into not other, other patrons in those houses, but they also bump into the walls and in particular scratch the walls. And that's really an unfortunate um, element of having 3.8 million people walk through the city of Pompeii at any given time. So one of the things I wanted to point out is this is a little ante room. We don't know what it was for. It could have been a storage room. It could have been a place where maybe your clients would sit out of the rain. There's no space on the exterior of the house like you have in so many other of these grand houses. And so what happens is with the street being so narrow, maybe this is where your clients wait for you to call on them. But the doorway is very, very low. I'm only 5'3", and I barely make it through the doorway without grazing my hair which means the people were very short, but also that there was a second floor above this. And that possibly is where the people who were enslaved and worked in the household lived. If you look ahead to the Corinthian columns, those Corinthian columns are about 23 feet high, just to give you a sense of how lofty that particular atrium is. It's a very impressive sight. But behind you here, 
you'll see the columns and you'll see the same kind of decoration work that we saw in the House of Orion here. And notice that this beautiful column, this beautiful fluted column here has been clad on the bottom with about eight to 10 feet worth of stucco that's been painted to reflect maybe porphyry. It's been you know, faded a little bit. It's a little bit darker than Chinnabar. So they think that maybe this is actually porphyry. There's the stairwell that led to possibly where enslaved individuals in the house or storage happened to be kept. All right, and a better sense of what the wall would have been decorated with up. This house very sadly was bombed during the Second World War. So one of the reasons why it has undergone an extensive renovation was because when they were doing renovations after World War II, they used a lot of concrete, which is very caustic and it's very heavy. So now what they're doing with all of the restorations for these houses is they're taking that material away and they're using a bio-neutral material that won't erode or cause pressure on the original walls. And they're using a lot of wood, laminated wood or wood clad in lead so that it doesn't rot um, as easily. And the nice thing about wood is if there should be another seismic activity, and there, there was when I was there in the fall, um, wood flexes a little bit so it protects the walls and it will allow the walls to move with that. So here we have this beautiful, like it's, it's incredible, the colors that you see still on the wall. And just below it down here, remember I said pay attention to that little courtyard, that little, that little space between both the atrium in the first part of the house and the second part of the house, it must have been awfully dark. You know, you must have either had to carry a, a torch, like some kind of lighting device with you when you went through, but that's what it looks like when you come into the personal domain of the people who owned this particular house. Up here, we have the kitchen. There you can see the latrina. We, we talked extensively about latrina in previous, so I won't, I won't go into that issue, but I you know, we, we can talk about it at the end if you like. And here, this is the exterior part of the latrina right here, because this is where the bath complex is. It's a beautiful garden. Um, and so you could have an opportunity to go outside and exercise in the fresh air if you wanted to. You could swim in the open air pool that was there. It's right here behind this fence. And of course, there's that little laneway that leads off to that. And so people who maybe have permission from the owner to come in and use just the bath complex could come down that little laneway. If you were bringing goods into the house, rather than bringing your goods like charcoal, food, what have you, instead of bringing them through the main part of the house, which would carry them right through the atrium, you could actually come in that little, little space from the vehicle behind Caecilia's house and enter here. And most importantly, um, and again, talking about latrina, um, if you needed to empty the cesspit because they didn't have sewers like they did in Herculaneum. So these were really cesspits and you needed to take out material that would not be good to carry through a house. You could take it out through that little laneway. So it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting house because you don't see that in any other part. And here we come out to this Rhodian, they call it the Rhodian peristyle, because the columns are set in just such a different way. This is the private part of the house. This is where people might have their bedrooms. And what's really cool, and I think, Ginny, we were talking about this at an earlier um, presentation, was, you know, furniture. And what did furniture look like? And how much furniture was in a house? And what was the furniture made of? And I've often wondered since, could it be that these were bedrooms? Could they have been perhaps small little dining rooms? Could the furniture have been portable enough to allow them to move it around the house? So today it might be a meeting room. Tomorrow it might be a bedroom. Because the, the way the rooms are constructed and decorated, they could be used for a variety of purposes. And they're small enough that you really can't get a sense of what kinds of things would have gone on. If you're looking at just this room, the first thing that pops to mind, of course, is when you walk into the house of Menander and you see their great atrium and the garden behind that and their peristylium. This is an Etruscan inscription in the house because they were reusing building materials, which I thought was, you know, 
that's really quite interesting. You would use things that, you know, if you're refurbishing a house or you need to bring in materials, yes, you would go and get new materials, but why wouldn't you use things that were also locally available? So when the when the um, tour guide was telling us that, I thought, that's pretty cool. We should talk about, you know, how did the Romans do things? How did they refurbish? How did they restore? This always impresses me when you come into a room and you see the quality of the painting on the walls and the depths of the color. So they've been able to hide from the you know, light and from water, the plaster which is on the walls. This would rival any wall that you see in Oplantis. But what's really cool is if you look at the floor, um, and I've spent a lot of my time recently trying to recall what the floors are like, this is exactly the same kind of definition you would have marking the edge of a room and the corridor that you're walking along. And so what we have is the Cochapesto floor right here. So that's ancient linoleum. But to mark the difference between the room itself and the corridor into the peristylium, you have this beautiful little marble mosaic. It's just so elegant, but it marks the transition between the rooms. This you would also see at Oplantis if you're looking behind their grand atrium and you're looking into a little garden at the back, almost identical to this, is this plaster frieze which you see up here, which is carved. It's um, so, so elegant and so light, but it would be such, you know, to grab the eye and help you look around the top of the peristylium when you're looking up the columns. And here is the grand garden something like you would see in the house of the garden. Right here, and I apologize for the quality of the picture because I was there at noontime, so, and I'm trying to make my way through all of the hordes of people. It's very difficult, I have to say, when you're in a house like this to get pictures without people in it. Sometimes you're happy about that, <laughs> sometimes you're not. But here, this is an outdoor triclinium. And you can see there's the couches right here. You put your bedding down on top of it so you could recline and enjoy the outdoors. This is where you would have for us, this is where we go for barbecue, right? So here is a little table in the center and a right across and they've got it blocked off quite wisely because there is a very deep pool right there and it had a fountain in the center. So it's kind of like ancient air conditioning and it would also water the grass. And so they've replanted some of the trees, which in years to come will fill that whole area with some beautiful shade. And you can almost imagine the children of the family playing over here, right? Or the dog that guards the front being allowed to leave the front for a little bit and run in the back and enjoy it. And just over here behind this wall, that's the house of Orion. So just to recap very, very quickly, it's, it's a huge house. It has beautiful decoration. Clearly the person who lived here had high taste, had traveled, knew people, particularly people who might have traveled to Rome. He may very well have also had business connections with the family of Papaya. Um, and you can see just exactly how much of his house is actually garden space. So here we have that large garden with the exterior um, triclinium here. We have another small posticum that if they come out this doorway would take them to the house of Orion. We have the bath complex here. This is all garden as well. And then this is that grand atrium. It It's an impressive house, compact. It's like a country house in the middle of a bustling city. All right, let's go over to the house of the Vetii. Everybody likes the house of the Vetii. I specifically was very careful with the pictures I chose in case anybody wanted to show this to their class of grade fives, because there are some dodgy pictures in the house of the Vetii that I was very careful to avoid for that purpose. Um, and one of the things I was really happy about when I put this particular slide together and PowerPoint did this for me, was it actually made the house look like it is on the corner. It's an odd house to, at the best of it, um, as we know. And again, remember, as I was saying, if we pay attention to the exterior, there's that chinabar, which is very, very faded. You can see it here. There's the white plaster on the top. Over here, now you exit through this part of the house today. You go in the doorway here where you see the people standing on the stones. This is the way you go in. And this is the way you come out. But in ancient times, that was not a passageway that was actually blocked off. They put that in to help people move through the house. There was always a lineup. 
Um, even if you book your tickets in advance, there is always a lineup. This part of the house here, which is on the Via del Mercurio, and this is kind of, you know, apropos because Mercury being, you know, the god of merchandise, merchants, um, this actually was a taberna. And there was even inside the possibility of stabling maybe some small animals, which is kind of cool if you think about it. And if you think about the Vetii, they were really involved in a lot of different kinds of mercantile ventures. So when you come into the front door, it's halfway down the street on the street named after them. And of course, as we know about the Vetii, they were two former slaves, right? Enslaved people. Um, Aulus Vetius Conviva, and Aulus Vettius Restutus. And Restutus seems to have been um, an Augustalis, which means that that was an office held very frequently by freedmen. So very likely they were constantly in the position of entertaining people. And what's really cool about this is there is a feeling that two individuals own this house as two individuals, not as one family unit. They likely weren't related by blood, but rather by the fact that they had both formerly served the same individual. And so one of the things I wanted to point out was um, just how unique their house is, because you don't really find this in many other places. Um, and I've never seen a gunaclam before, but here we go. So this area right here, that's on the corner. Over here, down here, this would be where you find the back door, the posticum of the House of the Dancing Fawn. And then this would have been the little brown patch that you see there. That's where they would have had that little mercantile venture, whatever that was. There's no real record of what it is. When you go in through the main entrance over here, you enter then into the atrium. And on this side, there's the remains, and I'll show you a picture of that. There's a remains of one of the strong boxes. And on the opposite side, there's a remain of the other strong box. So clearly each of those individuals is showing that he has his own type of wealth. You have two small rooms on either side of the entrance, which is really interesting. They could have been bedrooms. They could have been meeting rooms. We have two ally, two wings. And what's really interesting, we don't see that in many places, is that there are windows looking out onto their peristelium. So when you walk through the front door, the first thing you're struck by is not so much the presence of the atrium, the presence of money being very, you know, much there visible in the atrium but the peristelium. If you turn immediately then to your right, the blue section that you see here, that is the area of the house, which is completely self-contained. And that's where the people who were enslaved to the house happened to live. And what's interesting about that is the quality of the artwork that you see inside. And I remember, I think it was the third edition, Jenny and Martha, you'll have to remind me, but I remember when we looked at the house, and we were looking at the Lorarium. We had a picture of the Lorarium from the House of the Vetti. And indeed, this is from the House of the Vetti, but it's not the Lorarium of the Vetti brothers themselves. This is the Lorarium that was in the part of the house reserved for their servants. Mm -hmm. And so there's a beautiful atrium. It's massive. This lady, remember I was saying that this is part of the problem when you go to Pompeii. This lady right here, kind of walked into my picture at the same time as I was taking it, but it was perfect because look how high off the floor it is. Look how big that is. And it's not just that, but the kitchen is very clearly in their part of the house. There's the latrina right there, but this is a little room off the kitchen and look how beautifully decorated it is. They have stairs up to the surface quarters above. And so one of the things that I wanted to mention was the fact that there seems to have been a great deal of interest and care taken by the men who owned this house to make sure that the people who were working under them in this house also had access to beautiful artwork. They didn't just see it in the house that belonged to the Vetii themselves, but they also had something that they could take pride in in their own part of the house. And I thought that was that, you know, was very meaningful given, you know, the fact that the Vetii brothers were formerly enslaved. And when you walk out here through the peristelium, you have these two exedri right here. Possibly those were the tablina, one for each brother, right? It, it's possible. They call this part of the house here the gunikayam. There are two small little bedrooms right here. And there is also a little impluium that's open to the sky. 
which is very interesting. I've, I've never seen that either. I thought maybe they would have been set aside for visitors to the house. You have this massive peristylium, but what really is breathtaking is the room of the cupids, this triclinium that opened onto the peristylium. And if you notice the size of the house, notice that again, half of the house is garden. That whole notion of having this personal private space that you could call your own, this kind of rural existence inside of an urban space. So there's what it looks like from the front door. And I, again, I was very careful to make sure there's nothing dodgy so you can use it in class here. But if you look at the atrium itself, you'll notice that the floor is Cochapesto. So it's not got this massive mosaic through it. And maybe that's quite wise because if you have lots of people coming to your house, the potential damage done to a mosaic would be very great. But a Cochapesto floor, kind of like linoleum, it could handle a fair bit of movement on it. There are all sorts in this room and in the opposite rooms aside it, all sorts of examples of mythology. The paintings are all mythological. And it's really interesting because you have pictures that would be appropriate to looking at like Pasiphae and Ixion and Ariadne and Pentheus and Dearce. Um, kind of if you think about it from the perspective of why would you put pictures of this in here? But you could use these pictures with your kids in a mythology class to see if they could actually pick out the, the myths of the people who are in it. And as soon as you walk through the front door, the first thing that hits you is not so much the atrium itself, but the beauty of the garden beyond. So very quickly, I'll just take you very, very quickly through. This room that we see right here, this exedra that was to the north, a lot of mythological pictures in this room. When you come out, the first thing you come to is this gunakayam. So you can see where it had its own atrium or its own impluium right here, excuse me, and the compluium, which was right there. There is the triclinium, which is absolutely breathtaking. The restoration of this has been just exquisite. There is no way around that. Then you have, of course, the garden. And I'm looking backward now into the room at the back. And one of my favorite pictures when you go in, they have all of these little cupids all over the place. But one of my favorite pictures is this little cupid who is riding a crab. I have no idea why. It's just cute. It seems to stand out as something whimsical. And then here we have a game, another Exedra room. And beside it, you would go out to the back of the house and go beyond. So we're looking at a house that with all of this material that you see, all of the paintings, these they believe were all done after the earthquake. And that's why they're in such good repair. All right, we're almost at the end. I hope, I hope you're with me so far because I'm racing through. We have now cut across the city and we are going down out through the gate leading toward Herculaneum. It's lined on both sides with a series of houses, believe it or not, and a large number of tombs. And when you get to this tomb right here, you pass by this wall. And for years, I just thought it was a wall. I had no idea this was actually the largest house in Pompeii. It is the house of Marcus Arius Diomedes, and it's named for the tomb of the fellow straight across, not this tomb that you see here, but straight across. There's just this little inscription on this massive, like, wall of stone. And I should have known it was something special because the stairs are marble or bits and pieces of marble. And when you come into this house, and again, remember I was saying that one of the things that's really striking is they didn't, you know, make the the hill fit their home. They fit their home to the hill. This is an upside down house. So you have some public rooms when you come up those stairs and you enter into the first of what would have been the atrium and there's a little peristyle there. The actual private part of the house is down below. And you can actually walk through the Cryptoporticus down to the level that may very well have been on the ancient beachfront or very close to the ancient beachfront. So over here in this area, we have at the front of the house, a bath complex and the kitchen, very similar to what we just saw in the house of the Silver Wedding. This is the floor plan. Nobody can figure out exactly what the deal with this house was. 
who really owned it. We don't really know. All of the artwork has been stripped out of it. So if I were to take you through each room, all you would see is nothing but bare stone, which isn't really all of that interesting. What is interesting about the house is the sheer size of it. And um, I was asking a lot of questions um, as I'm apt to do when I'm in a new space that I wasn't really sure, like I didn't really know what this was when they opened it. And when the door was open, um, and in Pompeii, that's the rule. If the door is open, you get to go in that house. If it's closed, you don't go in, but if the door is open, you do go in. And so I went in and I was looking around and it didn't seem really all of that impressive at first. And then the lady said, well, you need to go downstairs. And I said, how do you do that? And she said, you go down the stairs through the crypto portico, which you don't usually get to do in Pompeii. And you come out then into the lower garden. And that's where the family would have been in the upper part of the house. So here's the entrance. There are tombs all along there, tombs across the street. There's the entrance you come up. Over here is the bath complex and the kitchen. And so I was asking questions and she said, come with me. And she took me into the kitchen and the bath complex. So there's the little peristelium that you would see when you first came into the house, a series of meeting rooms alongside. There's the stove in the kitchen. There is part of the open water swimming pool that you would have had. This is the caldarium, so there's the hot water pool, but she made very sure to point this out to me, that this had been renovated at some point, and they put this slab of marble down over top of this really pretty little mosaic, and it broke away as a result of all the material that fell into the house, and what she wanted to show me was these little sandals. You see the, these little tiny sandals that are there? Were they a warning that if you walk on that part of the floor, you're going to burn your feet because you're coming into the caldarium? It's possible. That's what she thought it was. This is the crypto portico. It's kind of steep. You got to watch how you're walking. You go down some stairs. They're a little uneven. Then you go down this passageway. I wasn't really sure I was ever going to come to the bottom. I have to tell you there it's dark in many spots. And then all of a sudden you'll have these light wells, which must have served the people who are working in the house quite well. And there is the actual house on the bottom. So again, it fit the hill. So there are all sorts of storage rooms. There must have been something about this house. Maybe it produced olive oil. Maybe it was producing wine. Maybe there were things that they were importing or exporting. This is what I really wanted to show you, which was the garden. So similar to the gardens that we've been looking at through the House of the Vetae and, of course, the House of the Silver Wedding, there's a massive water pool right here. And then we don't really know. She didn't really know what this part was. And I wondered if perhaps that could have been an enclosed area. Maybe that was the tablinum for the family. And you're looking backward. When you look up this way, that's the top part of the house that appears as you're walking through the tombs. It is a neighbor to the house of the mysteries, the Villa of the mysteries, as you continue on. It's about 300 meters beyond that. So it was on the edge of what would have been on the waterfront at that particular point in time. And clearly it was owned by someone who was extraordinarily wealthy. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, that has brought me to the end of the new treasures that you find in Pompeii. And hopefully this desire to see how the other half lives, this desire to see things that really only separate us from people virt by virtue of time, we can see how we are very similar to the people in the ancient world. We love beautiful things around us. We made the most of our houses. They're our sanctuary. They're where we take refuge when we've had a hard day. And that is my journey through Pompeii. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> that was really something. My goodness gracious. I hope everybody enjoyed all of those Homes that she showed us, um, goodness, um, <laughs> questions. Um, yes, our audience, I'm... yeah, please feel free to ask any questions Absolutely. that you may have. Absolutely. The house, the last house that I showed you, by the way, is really important because they found the remains of 36 people in that house. 18 of them were in the basement. There were some up above and some were in the basement. And one of the skeletons actually had about 1,300 cisterces on them. 
So this person must have been racing out of the city, you know, and taking refuge because you would go down, you're close to the water, right? Oh, question? <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you, what in particular are you looking forward to seeing the next time you go that you haven't already seen? Well, I don't know, because we're going to see it together. So I hope you have some really good shoes. <laughs> she always complains because I run her through the city of Pompeii. Um, the next time, I think when we go, uh, I would love to see the House of the Castiamonti and all of the work that's being done on the House of the Castiamonti from a pedagogical point of view. When they open that house and they show us, like give us an opportunity to bring our students in and watch as the excavators are doing the very tedious and careful work of removing the lapilli and the ash from what is essentially an insula that we don't really have. I think I'm really looking forward to that. And I'd also hope that we get permission. Um, I'm just waiting to hear back. If we can go down the Vianola, just beyond where the houses of Orion and the garden are and see that new house where they think they found pizza. It's not really pizza, where they think they found pizza because that is the house where they think the bakery acted as a prison. And so I'm I'm excited to see that come out as well. Oh, any, are there any other questions I can answer? <laughs> Holy smokes. What do they make of these houses with these very odd layouts and a ridiculous amount of rooms? You know, is some of it like, I know with the 1800s with the Gilded Age and some yes. of that in the United States, you added on rooms just because you could, you know, Yeah. You, you gave purposes to dumb things, basically. So what's the what did the Pompeians say about I mean, the current Pompeians or guides? You know, it's it's a way of showing off your wealth because you have them. You can have people come into your house. If you think about I, I liken it in many respects to going into a doctor's office. Um, because you know how you have like they book three and four people for the same time period. You could literally have people waiting to see you as your clients or business partners, and you could have them sitting in different rooms waiting for oh. you to make your appearance. Um, but it's it's all about wealth, or at least that's what my friend Susanna uh, says. You know, when you go and you see these, it's it's about showing off, having more wall space to demonstrate more artwork, which that's makes sense. Oh, Natalie, sorry. Roy, Natalie Roy has a question. Natalie, just unmute okay. yourself if you can. There you go. Okay, um, Margaret Ann, my question is, when you saw the um, little area outside the house where the graffito that, you know, might prove that the eruption was in November, can you yeah. tell me how big the graffito was? Like, basically, it's, just give me a, like it an is, estimate. You actually you actually have to get really, really close to it. Every picture that you see is blown up because it's like this big. Right. And it's on a wall that is, and what's interesting about it is why on earth, because this is one of the things I asked the guide who is in the house. And I said, why would they put that there? And why is there no artwork on these walls? And he said to me um, that this house was actually being renovated when the eruption occurred. And so a lot of the walls had been either stripped um, of, their, of their previous artwork because they had replastered over it. So maybe somebody just for whatever reason put that little graffito there for whatever reason, because okay. they knew it was going to be plastered over when they finished decorating I the see. house. It's it's really kind of yeah. um it's really kind of neat when you go in because you have part of the house that was of course refurbished but you have a whole section of the house which you can only see because they won't let you walk down there and um, that's where they're doing the work so they don't let anybody go down where they happen to be because you have to have hard hats and special shoes and things like that um so i'm anxious to see two years on what is available but yeah nobody it's interesting you know you ask the people who are the supposed experts and everyone still just gives you conjecture because nobody really knows right Okay, thanks. That's so interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other things that I can answer for you? Oh my goodness. I, I stayed to my time, Martha. Look, I didn't go over my time. <laughs> it's racing through. Good job. <laughs> Good will. Yes. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, Jenny, we'll let you uh, stop the recording.
And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for attending this evening. Yeah. Again, if anybody needs a certificate, just uh, email us training at cambridgelatin.org and uh, we'll get that out to you as quickly as possible. And thank mm -hmm. you everybody for attending. Have a